Greetings, Uzipur World viewers. Our distinguished guest today is Sarah Simons, a co-founder and executive director of Your Future Coalition International Nonprofit Fighting Human Trafficking and Gender Violence with Education, Shelter and Training. Sarah, we know that long before launching Your Future Coalition, you were notable as a recording artist and music composer for television. Upset with a documentary depicting the stories of human trafficking victims, you realize that you want to start on a new path. What does it take to combat trafficking in persons? So Her Future Coalition started in 2005, and our mission is to help survivors of human trafficking and other severe forms of gender-based violence to recover from their trauma and to rebuild their lives. And the only way to do that is through long-term intensive programs that really address the root causes of human trafficking and gender-based violence. And where do you get support from? Can you name your donors? Yes, well, most of our funding still comes from individual donors. Um, we do get some grants. We have a grant from the Annenberg Foundation this year, from Dining for Women, um, and from the Catherine Bertini uh, Trust Fund for Girls Education, and some others. But uh, the majority of our funding does still come from individual donors, and a lot of that is small donors who give, you know, $50, or $100, um, as well as you know, some, some larger families and family foundations. And then we have a small amount of income that comes from the sale of products made by the survivors um, through a social enterprise. They make beautiful sterling silver jewelry, and a small amount of uh, our income comes from that as well. So this became your economic alternative to help girls gain independence. Could you tell us more about that? So even from the very beginning, um, Finding economic alternatives was a very important part of the work. In fact, when we started, it really was the main thing that we did um, because when girls are rescued at a young age, they can rejoin society through education and, you know, and so they grow up, maybe go to college and, and rejoin society that way. But for girls that are rescued at a later time, they may have no primary school education or they just may be at an age where what they really want is independence and they want to be self-supporting. And some of them also have children that they want to support. And for them, the reason that they got trafficked was that one of the reasons was poverty and, and the fact that there are very few jobs and opportunities for women. So we really wanted to work on that issue. And even though today we have other programs for younger children, like education and shelter, the job training is still a very important part of what we do. And one of the most effective solutions um, that we've had over the years was our jewelry training program. And through this program, we've trained over 100 women to become goldsmiths. And metalsmithing in Asia is primarily done only by men or, well, exclusively been done only by men. And you know, certain families do this kind of work. So it was quite groundbreaking um, for them to be trained as goldsmiths. And they loved it because you take a piece of metal, it doesn't look like anything. And through your work, you hammer it and you saw it and you take a flame to it and you transform it into something beautiful. So they could see through this, you know, transformations are possible every day. And if it's possible for this piece of metal, it could be possible for my life too. Could you tell us more about the new center in Calcutta and why do you find it important for your future coalition? So a lot of our projects are actually in Calcutta, India. Um, it's kind of where well, we started in Nepal, but the very first time I went to Calcutta, I just felt such a sense of belonging and a very warm welcome um, from the people and from the NGOs that were already working in the area. So it, it just gave us a very um, a good place to, to grow and to take root. And so we've always had a lot of programs there. Um, we built a shelter in that area and we expanded a different, another shelter. And then a few years ago, we opened red light resource centers, which are for children who are growing up in red light areas, you know, to have a place where they, can, where they can study and be safe in the afternoons. Um, and our newest project that we're just putting together now is a larger computer training center where we'll also be teaching job skills, life skills, financial literacy. Sarah, and when do you think the project will be implemented? 
So we are looking for a space for it now and um, just kind of cementing the local partnerships for the computer training and the other aspects of it. So we're hopeful, hopeful to be able to open it later this year. However, with COVID, everything is, you know, a little bit up in the air, um, I think for everyone and certainly for us. The schools in India are just reopening. Um, private schools, I think, just reopened and public schools are still closed uh, for the most part. So um, a lot of things that we do have been changed or have been very different in this past year. And so we're waiting to see, you know, in the next month or two, what happens with with the virus and with the vaccine and um, hope, hoping that if all goes well, that we can open our center uh, in this this fall. But if the vac- you know, if the virus continues to be a major, you know, block, then maybe early in 2022. Are there any age restrictions? It will be serving girls from uh, 14, you know, up through really any age. A lot of survivors are in their late teens and early 20s um, when we start working with them. So probably have a lot of older adolescents and young adults in that in that project. But we are also going to open open it to girls who are in high school. How many instructors do you plan to attract to the project? And will you have the lecturers from the USA or any other countries? Well, we, for the U.S., you know, because it is such a long journey, <laughs> um, you, you do have volunteers that come. Um, but most of our, almost all of our staff day to day is coming from the local area, you know, from India or if we're in Nepal, you know, from Nepal, from this specific locality. Um, so for this new project, we probably expect to have um, three or four teachers really focused on the computer side of the work. And, um, you know, for teachers who are doing more of the English or general tutoring for, for the kids. And then a, a rotating team of workshop leaders, you'd be part-time, you know, would just come in and teach karate or yoga or dance, you know, once or twice a week or financial literacy or do counseling or what have you. So are you willing to expand your geography to help other countries support human trafficking victims? I would love to expand our geography and take a model that, you know, we have developed and have found a way to make it successful and to bring it into other places. Um, so I definitely would put that on my wish list for the future. Obviously, it depends on having, you know, sufficient funding, sufficient staff to be able to do that well. And also um, into finding partners. You know, we do everything in close collaboration with local organizations. We really believe strongly in collaboration is the only way we're going to get things done. And how did the human trafficking statistics change during the pandemic? It's very hard to know <laughs> um, because obviously with the pandemic, um, communications in so many ways have broken down and um, it isn't, it's already an underground issue. So it's, it's hard to track the numbers and the statistics. Um, I would say with less migration, you know, over the last year, um, hopefully that would lead to less new cases of human trafficking. But for people who have already been trafficked, maybe their situation would be a little bit worse because they're, you know, cut off from, even more cut off from the rest of the world or from a chance of getting rescued. How is the connection with your beneficiaries being established? So we connect with the victims uh, in a variety of different ways. Um, we usually connect with victims after they've been rescued and are in a rescue shelter. So we work in rescue shelters and um, we meet girls and connect with them and start working with them through that way. But we also work in um, very high risk areas where girls have not yet been trafficked. Um, so some of those include like border villages, uh, villages with a very high instance of trafficking. Like for example, um, I recently, co-wrote a book with one of the survivors in our program, a girl named Anjali. And she is going back to her village in Eastern Nepal and opening a school and a trafficking prevention program there, which we are also supporting. And that village has a very high incidence of trafficking and child marriage to the point where 75% um, of young girls are either put into a child marriage to prevent trafficking or are trafficked. And so uh, through this project, Anjali is hoping to, you know, change that and offer education and a different kind of future for the next generation of girls in her village. And so th those kinds of programs where we're working to prevent trafficking are 
are also one of the ways that we connect with our beneficiaries. Is there a time when you became emotionally overwhelmed as an anti-trafficking activist? If yes, how did you overcome that feeling? Definitely, there have been times when I felt emotionally overwhelmed um, by the sadness of this issue and you know the particularly meeting individuals and just hearing some very very tragic stories um, and you know even sometimes when you're traveling and there's just so many people so much poverty it can feel it can feel very overwhelming um, when I just try to remember as no one is expecting me or my organization to solve this problem alone and no, no organization or person could do so. Um, everything needs to be collaborative. And with people coming together from different parts of the society and different organizations, you know, slowly, slowly, we, we do see lives change. And while we can't fix the whole problem, even in one city, even in one, one area of a city, but we do see individual lives changing every day, and we've been able to walk beside thousands of girls and and help them working together with others and help them to become free and independent and to stand on their own feet and you know for each one person it is worth it um, she refuses to let the past define her and she's really focused on writing a new story for herself and also for the next generation of girls in her community but many of the girls are also just contributing in small ways you know they're becoming a mother who educates her daughter or who makes sure that her niece or neighbor is girls are going to school you know some girls are rescuing others some girls are making sure others get educated and you know a lot of them work with animals they love to take care of street animals and care for those who are creatures who are even more vulnerable um, and they love to see that in them their tenderness and compassion for others is one of the finest and most inspiring things about them. So I would say almost everyone that we've worked with is giving back in some way. Once they get past the immediate crisis, the first thing they want to do is care for others. And that makes me so proud. What change should be done to remove this global issue from the agenda? So human trafficking everywhere in the world has its roots in poverty and in the low status of women and in the low status of certain members of society. And if people have other opportunities for their children and for themselves, they'll be way, way less vulnerable. And a lot of people, you know, ask me, uh, do people sell their children? And, and that is, that does happen, but it's very less common. More commonly, people are going in search of work um, or people are sending their children hoping for them to have better opportunities, not for them to be in slavery and exploitation. And people have to make these decisions because of poverty, because they're so desperate. So I think we really need to work on, you know, around the world on alleviating poverty and especially in the most vulnerable communities to make sure that there is universal education um, for, for all children, boys and girls. And if children are in school, if they're you know, going through 10th grade or through 12th grade, they're much less likely to be trafficked. And then as adults, they'll have literacy, they'll be able to read a contract, and they'll be better able to protect themselves. So I think the number, number one thing we can do is, is make sure that everyone is getting an education and also to work on you know, the economic alternatives in the most vulnerable groups. And the other thing is that trafficking and slavery thrives in silence and in darkness and shame. So the less we talk about it and the more we wish to push it down and, not, and hide it, the more it will thrive. So we need to have open and honest conversations and awareness of what is going on. And there is something everyone can do to help. You know, maybe you are tutoring a vulnerable young person in your community. You know, maybe you are involved in working for um, advocating for g better legislation or government change or changing laws. You know, maybe you're just educating others, talking to young people that, in your own circle um, to help them understand and make good choices. Um, and I think when many young people go overseas for work, um, they need to have a way to make sure that what they're going to is 
not a trafficking situation. Systems in place that a person, a young person could check, um, is this a real job? You know, will my, will I be safe? Will my passport be taken from me? Um, and, and they have some where they can call and a place that they can go if they are in a vulnerable situation. So I think, you know, just all of us keeping our eyes open, um, not letting anyone be invisible, making sure that all children get an education and working on um, economic solutions for the most vulnerable communities. And this was Sarah Simons. Thank you for watching and goodbye.